the conquest of the deep offshore is an extraordinary adventure uh, that is in progress. C can you tell us, please, what place will have deep offshore in uh, 2030? It's always uh, uh, interesting to uh, put those, uh, these technology debates into the context of the, of the market. If we put ourselves in 2030, 35, and if we follow the, uh, the fundings of the uh, International Energy Agency, uh, over 75% of the uh, primary energy demand is going to be uh, fossil fuels. And uh, in, in there, we, we're going to have 55% typically oil and gas. So oil and gas is going to be very, very present. Now, today, uh, oil and gas offshore represent between 30, 35% of the oil and gas produced uh, worldwide. That was in 11, 2010, 2011. If we put ourselves in, uh, in 2025, that number is going to increase uh, over 40%, so growing and probably because of the uh, very high depletion rates of, uh, of uh, existing fields. Now, if we look, in, if we focus in this particular area on the deep, deep offshore, and when I say deep offshore, I mean the uh, above, let's say, well, below uh, 1,500 meters of water, uh, what we see, what we expect in the next five years is typically a 20% growth uh, per year in the next five years. So basically, subsea will be big in 2030. 30, 35, so it's going to be quite an interesting business. Now, uh, if we look at the way those fields are developed, uh, you have uh, on, on the slide right now a typical example of a, a, a project that which is well known in this audience, obviously. Uh, I'm talking about the Pass Flora project. Just, just to, make, uh, to make it short, I mean, we talk about uh, 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 the sheer size of the project. We talk about typically 50 subsea wells, producers or injectors. We talk about 120 uh, kilometers of uh, of flow lines, we talk about risers and flow lines. So it's, it's huge. Uh, so what's gonna happen in 20 years time? Uh, already we are seeing some innovative uh, technologies being developed on such a field, and I'm sure some of my colleagues will come back on that later, no doubt. Um, but uh, things will evolve again. Uh, we're gonna see probably, uh, probably more uh, processing subsea, maybe less facilities on, uh, on the sea surface. Uh, new technologies, uh, and we're going to come back on that a bit later. But what is, one thing is sure uh, is basically uh, the technological advances will change subsea architecture. And I think that's what we're trying to, to show to you today. Yes, uh, Alain, now let's step back. Can you tell us about the history of conquest of the sea depth? Do you have any key figures about the depth that, that was reached? I think uh, over 20 years, 28 years of uh, career in this business, <laughs> I've got a few <laughs> figures. <laughs> I mean, Michel uh, reminded us uh, uh, that basically we were drilling in the, in the Mediterranean Sea uh, back in 82, and we reached 17, 80 meters. At the same time, uh, from a production system perspective, we were actually around in the continental shelf in the North Sea, we were around 100 meter water, water depth mark. In Brazil, we were probably around the 160. Now, uh, when we look at the conquest of the uh, deep offshore, it's been, it seems like it's been a race between the uh, Gulf of Mexico and Brazil. I mean, back in 94, I um, mean, Shell on the auger field actually went down to, uh, to 870 meters typically. At the same time, Petrobras was installing their first flexibles in 1,000 meter water. Uh, basically, I had to talk about flexibles, but I'll come back on that later, I'm sure. Um, and, and then in, in 96, 97, uh, uh, at the same time, Shell was actually again uh, uh, laying on Mensa pipelines in uh, 7, 16 uh, uh, meters of water. Petrobras, again, was actually laying flexible pipes in, uh, on Malim Sul in 1,700 meters of water. Uh, then we went on to uh, uh, Nakika, or before Nakika in this audience, I should not have forgotten uh, Canyon Express, uh, basically, for those uh, that were involved in those projects, 2,200 uh, meters of water in the Gulf of Mexico. Then the Kika uh, in 2004, uh, 2,000 meter, 2,200 for the deepest wells. First uh, pipe in pipe STRs, steel catenary risers in the Gulf of Mexico again. And more recently uh, on Perdido in the Gulf of Mexico, we reached subsea wells at 2,960, if my memory is correct. So near 3,000 meter water depth. And this is where we are producing these days Petrobras, this time in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, uh, put the uh, Cascade Chinook field on stream uh, earlier this year in 2,600 meters of water. So that's quite impressive if yes. you look at uh, what has happened that with past enormous, 10 years. That's enormous, almost yeah. 3,000 meters. So Claude Valenchon, what has allowed the industry to reach 3,000 meters? 
Yeah. In fact, it's a combination of evolution, of uh, innovation, and also of uh, what we should never forget, investment, massive investment by the, 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 the industry, in, uh, in particular in marine, uh, marine equipment, marine vessels, you know, uh, to allow to, to reach these water depths. And I would just name a few, I would say, uh, examples. You know, first, the engineering capabilities of the, the industry, together with the software and all the, the hardware, uh, to, to allow to do all this complex calculation in terms of, I would say, what we call the flow assurance, in terms of the hydrodynamics, mechanical things, and so on, and also in terms of the, all the material that we are using, exotic materials sometimes, that are very quite complex to use, knowing that what we install subsea has to stay uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, maintain its, its uh, qualities during 20 years or more, you know. So, in addition to all this aspect of engineering, I would, I would mention, you know, the, the drilling, you know, that has already been mentioned uh, just earlier on, you know, with the, the wells uh, in the Mediterranean uh, Sea, uh, already 20 or more years ago. Uh, drilling, uh, you know, today the drilling vessels are able to drill be, be beyond the 3,000 meters already. Uh, I would mention also the subsea well heads and the control system, the way to control this well that could be uh, located at uh, 20 kilometers away from the FPSO, and this uh, is a very, uh, definitely a strategic element of the production because it's where all the oil comes from. And then I would mention, uh, and I have a slide to show uh, uh, the vessel that are used to install, uh, you know, these risers and flow lines. So here you see uh, at, at the left, at your left, the FDS-1, which was used uh, <laughs> about close to 15 years ago to install the girasol field in 1,300 meters uh, offshore Angola, and uh, the big sister, the FDS-2, that will be able to install you know, such, such fields in 3,000 meter water depths. So today, the industry is, I would say, developing the tools able to work in 3,000 meters. You know? uh, and uh, finally, I would mention the, the, the robots that we use uh, every, every day, you know, ROVs or AUVs, that are here to, again, uh, ensure the, the the, the, the good uh, behavior of all the equipment at subsea, you know, inspection by inspection, maintenance and repair at the 3,000 meter, as today the industry can do. Carl uh, Lelundin, you're working for the International Union for Conservation of Nature. What do you think of this rapid evolution, development of deep offshore? Do you think that the benefits outweigh the risks? Clearly, we're in a situation where we've made enormous progress in terms of engineering, but of course, we've also seen a number of significant new risks come about. Uh, clearly, when things go wrong, it's a lot harder to fix. So we probably need at least one level more of security in place to be able to deal with those type of risks. There are, of course, some advantages also. We're not in a situation where we have so many people present. So the actual risks to humans beyond the people working in the installations is significantly reduced, and that's, of course, a big advantage. I think there's also um, a, a lot more um, risks in terms of um, security for the future. And one aspect to consider there is perhaps uh, terrorism and, you know, to some degree, uh, people with civil obedience, which is coming up as a big issue. Finally, I would say uh, there are obviously technical solutions. I mean, one would be to have two r drilling platforms when you're doing these type of things, so you end up in a situation where it's quicker to actually mitigate uh, a blowout, for example. But if you don't consider the risk, what will happen? Do you have any example? But well, I guess the obvious one would be Macondo, which we're all very familiar with. Um, I think the interesting aspect there was that they thought from an engineering perspective that they had a foolproof system. And we sh clearly saw that that wasn't the case. So, you know, an extra level of, of uh, protection clearly will cost more, but I think the, the risk outweighs the, uh, the, the benefit here. And I think that the bottom line here is that the, the company has a license to operate, but this license can be revoked. And in fact, you can jeopardize your whole operation if you don't do this in a good way. So that, I think, has changed the dynamics in the industry. We're basically in a situation where we can't fail because a failure is so big that it really uh, puts everyone at, at risk, including <laughs> the, the, the company itself. Um, I also think we, we tend to overemphasize some of the actual damages. Um, during the Macondo spill, I, halfway through it, I went out on Financial Times and said, I actually don't think the impact on fishing will be that great. Uh, my entire environment movement rose up against me and said, I'm a bad person. But from my perspective, actually, I think it gave a bit of a breeding space to 
the fishing because you know, it's, let's be honest, fishermen are a lot better at killing fish than the oil industry is. And the reality is they have been doing a <laughs> tremendous amount of damage to the bottoms and to uh, a lot of the fish stocks. The other thing that people don't think about is that large parts of the Gulf was actually dead. The bottoms were dead because of the runoff from the agriculture industry. And again, it's a, a typical ex example of where uh, we don't look at the broader picture. I mean, the President Obama went out and said this is the worst environmental catastrophe in US history. And frankly, I don't think that's true. And uh, Toral, from your point of view, what are the safety challenges in deep water and how, how to tackle them? You know, this, the, um, from a subsea perspective, we have always kept safety as the number one priority. Um, and as we continue to uh, move into deeper water, more sensitive areas, Arctic, we continue to raise the bar um, on, on safety, both personnel safety and also equipment safety and safe operation. Uh, we have, in fact, adopted many of this, the uh, techniques that the airline industry have done uh, to uh, ensure safety and safe operation. In a design phase, uh, for example, we do the same failure mode uh, analysis that uh, the, the airline industry does. We design for modularity to uh, ease the change out of components. We uh, design in redundancy to avoid single point failure. We actually are raising the bar significantly on uh, on uh, operator errors, meaning any errors from the operator um, will not uh, move uh, the equipment into an unsafe uh, position. Um, also, when we qualify new equipment, um, we have moved away from the old kind of API standard on, uh, on testing to acceptance. These days, we do the same as the airline industry. We test to failure, so we know exactly what the limitation of the, uh, the equipment is. Um, and during the operations phase, we have now moved in and installed um, condition monitoring systems, meaning we monitor components and critical systems so we can predict, predict um, remaining life before a, a components has to be changed out. So we have done a number of things within the industry uh, to protect uh, and, and ensure we have a safe operation. Very much the same technology as is used within the airline industry. Okay, and so what, what do you think has to be done to fully develop an offshore field? Well, you know, the, the, uh, the, we have come a, a, a long way. Uh, water depth was mentioned here as one criteria. If you really look at the long-term vision we have for subsea, is that one day we should be able to uh, develop offshore field without the use of surface facilities, meaning without platforms or without uh, FPSOs, so only develop it on, this, on the seabed. Um, and, and where are we in that, uh, in that uh, development? Well, if you think about it, we, um, we have several stages we have worked through. The, the, the current way is to say, let the reservoir do the job, pressurized res reservoir will push the fluid or push the gas to shore or to a uh, uh, facility. Uh, then you can say the next phase, and, and in that area, we are distance-wise from shore and from facilities, we are typically for a gas field, the longest gas field has been tied back, is in around 150, 160 kilometers, and the longest oil field has been uh, uh, tied back is in the 20, 25 kilometer range. So that's, that's when the reservoir does the work. Then you can start adding, the next state is to add uh, energy, meaning pumping or compression uh, to the subsea facility. Then you start to add more distance to a, a final facility. Our goal in that stage is to reach uh, 600 kilometers for gas and 200 kilometers for oil. Um, the final stage is when you can do all of the final separation, final treatment into export quality on the seabed, and there you could say distance from infrastructure is no limitation anymore. Still a number of technologies to develop, but that's where we are heading. And looking back over some years, we see that every time we are taking a major step forward, like past floor uh, processing on the seabed, we, we move one step further towards that final vision of having a, a platformless uh, offshore development. And Claude Valuchon, do you foresee some particular technical challenges to be overcome for the long distance tieback or the uh, subsea to beach? Yes, as Toro mentioned, you know, uh, energy must be given to the fluid and uh, this energy ultimately 
after separation or whatever process is needed, is provided by, by uh, either pumps or compressors. Pumps would require a few megawatts, you know, typically, and uh, compressors rather tens of megawatts. And uh, this power has to be, I would say, uh, uh, today, uh, electrical in the mind of everybody. And uh, uh, definitely it's a key to this uh, long, uh, long tie back. I'm sorry, you know, I have a bit of flu. Would you like to answer it? <coughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this the, the the power would be brought to the to the the users, you know, the compressors or the pumps through through subsea cables, and I would say uh, af after a certain distance from the generator, let's say 20 kilometers today, maybe very soon 50 kilometers, then the system becomes very complex because we have to use uh, high voltage power. And this will require subsea uh, uh, transformer, subsea uh, circuit breaker, and all this equipment are very sophisticated. In addition to that, many of the components, electrical components, have to remain at uh, atmospheric pressure or close to it, and this requires them to be enclosed in, into a, a, a atmospheric, I mean, uh, into a very pressure resistant equipment, which at, with the depth, you know, becomes uh, immensely big. Uh, there is an alternate to, uh, to I would say, the, the power cable, long distance power cable, is to have the, the power produced near the, the, the need. So we, if it is on the surface, for sure it's easy. Today we do it, you know, today uh, on, the, on the FPSO there is a power sufficient for compressors or whatever that could be subsea. But I would say that means that there is a surface facility. Uh, the other way would be to produce it subsea. And today, unfortunately, it does not exist. So the but, but I should say that uh, companies like DCNS, together with Areva, are proposing, uh, you know, subsea nuclear plants of 50 megawatt or more. And this could be one way, maybe, but it might pose some other problems, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about a modular approach, and what kind of a modular approach uh, do you propose to entirely? So I, uh, I automate? have a slide. Uh, yeah, you can move. <coughs> no, there is no um. equipment for that. Uh, yeah, on this slide you see, yeah. in fact, uh, and something that you could imagine in the near future, uh, it, it is composed of, uh, uh, to your uh, right, uh, a, you know, the long pipes are in fact uh, three-phase separation systems, and uh, next to it you have a number of uh, subsea equipment, including the pumps, that will first allow the gas and liquid, I mean the, 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 the gas and, sorry, and oil to be boosted towards either a, a process facility on surface or to the shore. Uh, and the produced water could be treated by uh, the oiler and the sander and sent to the execution wells. In the, next, next slide, please. So this is a view of the, 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 the I would say, the pro process for the, for the incoming oil and gas. The next slide will show uh, a system that, could, that is uh, currently under development that could take uh, water from the sea, uh, you know, salted water, and uh, the system could disinfect this water, remove solids and part of the salt, and re-inject the water directly in, in the reservoir to increase the recovery. So that, that's, I would say, a way to reduce the cost by removing all the surface facility to treat the water, the risers, and the flow line associated. So Valborg, uh, Valborg Lundegaard, let's talk a bit more about these modules assembled together uh, because uh, one part uh, of these modules are compressor units, as we just heard before. Can you tell us a bit more about the subsea gas compression units? Yeah, first, first a reminder to all of you why we need compression. Uh, as the pressure drops in the reservoir in just production. Just can't hear because, sure. yes, take the microphone. Better now? Yeah. So uh, as the pressure drops during production, after a time you will need pressure boosting in order to maintain production and have stable flow. And to optimize the recovery rate from the reservoir, the compressor should be able to operate of as low reservoir pressure as possible. And doing that, you achieve that by placing the compressors just next to the wellhead on the seabed. It's been a pleasure to be here today and listening to Total's focus on technology and innovation, and it's a pleasure for me to present some of the very exciting projects we are working on in Arco Solutions at the moment. And uh, first, I would like to start present the OSCA subsea compression project. It's the world's first full-scale subsea compression, and as an introduction, I have a small film.
it's not working. <laughs> it's, can you see it over there? Because on our screen it was just uh, yes. No film. Oh, it's just it was correct there. Oh, I'm so okay, pleased. Okay, great. Because hear. we did, couldn't yeah. see anything. Here. No, that's uh, <laughs> technology and innovation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but uh, what you saw here. It looks uh, small and cozy compared to a large platform, but actually this is complex and it's quite large. The size of this compressor uh, skid is 75 meters, 0.44 meters and 20 meters tall. And actually what we usually do to describe the size, we have put it in the National Football Stadium in Norway and we usually say this is the most exciting thing that has happened in this stadium for years. <laughs> but actually we were told by the Soccer Association not to do so. So that's why I haven't included that slide. But subsea compression for Oscar, operated by Statoil, will be in operation in 2015. And there are two full trains with cooler, scrubber, 11 and a half megawatt compressor and pump. And these will be installed at a water depth over 250 meters. There is an extensive technology qualification program, and this is certainly a first. But even though it's a first, we have already delivered subsea compression pilot. This is for another field on the Norwegian continental shelf, the Omen Lange field. And that field is located at 1,000 meter water depth, 120 kilometers from shore. And we have built a pilot, a full-scale one train, with a compressor of 12.5 megawatt, and it's currently being tested at a terminal on the west coast of Norway, down in a submerged in a pit. And in some time, Shell will have to des decide if they go for this full-scale. They will need compression. The difference between the Oscar subsea compression and the Omen lung compression is that at the Oscar field, there are floating facilities out on the field. Oscar has an FPSO and a semi-submersible and a storage vessel for condensate. And power to the Oscar subsea compression will be supplied from the FPSO. For Omen Lange, there is nothing. It's a subsea to beach development. And therefore, power will be supplied from shore. And this is an additional channel, 120 kilometers step out. And how, how do you get to drill that deep and with what kind of technologies? Well, uh, again, it's a pleasure for me to present the One of Arca Solutions project. And uh, I have a film of our H6E drilling rig. Six, because it's a sixth generation, and E, because it's extreme. So have a look at that. Hopefully it works it on works. that screen. <laughs> So two of these extreme drilling rigs are operated by Transocean currently. Uh, they can drill 10,000 meter uh, wells on 3,000 meter water depth. And the facilities are also designed for an operating temperature of minus 20 degrees. So it's certainly extreme. The principles for this rig are similar as for other rigs, but everything is bigger. The floater, of course, but also the storage areas. And we have a double ram rig to ensure efficient drilling. But sometimes you do not want the extreme version. And in Arco Solutions, uh, we have two well intervention vessels, more cost efficient. Uh, the first one is a project, the Cat B. It's a project for Statol, it's a service contract for Arco Solutions. And uh, this semi-submersible rig will fill the gap between well intervention and drilling rig because it can do heavy well intervention and sidetrack drilling. We estimate the cost savings to 40% of using a conventional rig. It can access, access all types of wells, whether it's from FMC or Arca Solutions, and shift rapidly between the various uh, operations, whether it's uh, coil tubing or wild on operation or sidetrack drilling. And it can operate on 500 meter water depths in 15 meter waves. There you have the picture, yeah. But I would also like to uh, tell you about another vessel. It's called the Skandiarker. And now you have to watch 
because yeah. Total has, uh, has signed a contract for using this vessel in Angola uh, next year. So please, another film. Great. So this well intervention vessel can operate at 800 to 3,000 meter water depth, and that is exactly what you need in Angola. And uh, with the increased number of subsea wells we will see in the future, and also the need for increased recovery of oil and gas, I am sure we will see more of these special vessels in the years to come. Thank you, Valberg. Alain Marion, I, I, I understand there are big challenges uh, in terms of the flow management with subsea direct to shore. So could you please describe us the physical conditions of this transit and if there are any other technological challenges? I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> in two minutes. <laughs> in two minutes. <laughs> First comment I can make is basically uh, deep ocean is a, is a world of, of darkness. Now, uh, let me reassure you after... Uh, 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 Iker's excellent movies. I'm not going to make you a remake of the uh, Laws of the Ring. That's not really the issue. And darkness is not really a problem for us. Uh, more seriously, the, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a world of very high pressures. I mean, each time we go down 10 meters, we increase one bar. By, by 1,500 meters, that's 150 bar. Uh, basically, it's like uh, exerting a, a pressure of uh, six tons on a uh, classical credit card. So that's a huge uh, mechanical constraint. And if you think there's a pipeline, especially uh, piping pipes, for instance, that have to, uh, on the inside, sustain the increasing high pressures that we have in the reservoirs, on the outside, to have these increasing uh, external pressures, I mean, that gives you an idea of, sort of the challenges that we have mechanically uh, that we have to face. But the, uh, the most important one in my mind is the one that we've discussed already uh, somehow in terms of temperature. Uh, by the properties of water, I mean, uh, the temperature of the water in the, in the sea bottom is, is, is around four degrees, wherever you go. And uh, that doesn't sound too low in terms of uh, material selection or in terms even of, uh, I mean, we see that uh, in, in all our countries uh, in wintertime, but uh, it is quite crucial when it comes to flow management, uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to the risk of, of hydrate formation somehow. And we know that hydrates are sort of a nasty compound that can actually clog pipelines and prevent uh, production. So uh, the way we historically have fought against that is by uh, adding a, a lot of uh, uh, passive insulation on the pipelines or injecting in certain key areas uh, methanol glycol in certain areas. Uh, but there are times where that's not, not enough because uh, no matter how insulating your pipeline is, the longer you leave it on the seabed, I mean, the more you're going to be uh, uh, exposed to, uh, to, uh, to reaching this equilibrium temperature. And that's why, basically, we've come up with uh, new technologies that you have, uh, and you have an example of that on the, on the, on the screen right now. It is called uh, adding energy to the pipeline itself. We talked about adding energy uh, to the fluid by introducing compressors and, and pumps. Now we are adding energy to the pipe itself in the pipe wall. This is called the heat tracing uh, pipe in pipe technology that uh, actually Total uh, installed uh, on, the, on the Islay field and commissioned earlier, uh, earlier this year. And by this technology, we are able to actually spiral uh, electric cables around the flow line, encapsulate all that into a, uh, a layer of very effective insulation material, uh, basically aerogel material, uh, and all that is atmospheric pressure within, within, the pipe, within the pipe wall. Uh, from an energy perspective, this is very efficient. By an order of magnitude more efficient than the classical electrical, direct electrical heating uh, technologies or the classical uh, hot water circulation uh, heating systems. So that's uh, quite, uh, quite, a, quite a challenge. Yes, you're talking about uh, very complex processes, so how, how can you make sure that you master these processes? Well, we try hard on that. <laughs> <laughs> very, very hard. And uh, as, uh, as, as Tour said uh, earlier, I mean, basically, these uh, technologies are not developed uh, overnight. I mean, uh, we started to work <laughs> on those things more than 10 years ago. 
uh, it, it took us uh, quite a few years to come up with a, with a basic, uh, the basic design, uh, try out the components, establish the uh, pre-industrial feasibility. And at some stage when the project is mature, then we have to go uh, to the, the operators, and uh, in that case, Total. And we, we actually set some time uh, apart with the Total team to actually, and we spent two years uh, looking at the, uh, uh, the, the final qualification of the concept and, uh, and basically going through the classical uh, uh, failure mode analysis, looking at prototype testing, looking at aging testing, and all sorts of things. That's for the qualification of the material and the product itself. Now, uh, for the field life, we have actually introduced some new technologies as well. In that particular case, we had introduced uh, optical fiber systems to monitor temperature. And the idea is actually on real time to be able to give some very precious information on the status of the pipeline itself. And one can even think of, at some stage, having some sort of electrical system that is automatically triggered by a temperature measurement which falls below a certain preset level. And now you start thinking in terms of what could be the next generation of intelligent pipelines. So yeah, can you talk a bit more about these intelligent pipelines? Of course I can. <laughs> <laughs> of course I can. Uh, I mean, we've, uh, with, 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 with ILA, we've, uh, we've actually touched on the, on the first generation of, uh, of active uh, uh, rigid pipelines. And we've got some similar, uh, some similar approaches for, for flexibles. Now, for those of you that are not very familiar with flexible pipe technology, uh, it is a, a technology whereby we assemble uh, steel uh, helically around, uh, around the structure and, uh, and, and, and thermoplastic layers to provide a, a structure which fulfills the same duty as a, as a rigid pipeline, but which is flexible. And what we've done uh, lately is basically to, uh, to transform these pipes into active pipes. And th the first time we did that was actually on the Dahlia field for Total uh, back in, in 2006 when we installed that offshore Angola. Uh, whereby, and this is the example you have on the left hand side on the slide, uh, whereby we are actually coupling the uh, gas lifting function with the production, uh, with gas lift tubes wrapped around the structure. Uh, now you have to uh, remember that the gas is actually injected from the top side, compressed at a uh, reasonably high temperature, and that structure feels like a, a huge heat exchanger where the gas lift actually goes down the bottom of the riser and everything is encapsulated into a high performance insulation system and actually, uh, the energy is actually brought back into the form of pressure at the bottom of the riser and bring the fluid up. So that was the sort of first generation of, uh, of uh, uh, let's say, active uh, structure. We've actually declined these concepts also into another version, which is the full electric version. And this is the one you have on the right-hand side, where we don't inject gas lift in that particular case, but we bring active heating through uh, trace heating again around, around the pipe. And this is what we are doing right now for Petrobras, uh, for the Papatera field. In that particular case, it wasn't so much hard rate formation. Uh, it was more a question of uh, high viscosity and bring the, uh, and push the, uh, push the oil uh, through the, the pipeline in a more effective manner. So by, by, by heating, we can actually uh, alleviate a number of problems associated with the huge pressure drop in the same way. So these are the active pipelines. Next generation is actually to couple those pipelines with condition monitoring. I've spoken about uh, earlier about those uh, fiber optics that can monitor temperature. What we have shown uh, lately is that those same fiber optics can actually uh, provide some useful information on the behavior of the pipe itself. We can, for instance, detect uh, water ingress in the pipe annulus, which is important because water can actually change the fatigue condition of the riser. At the same time, we can work on, uh, on bringing uh, using the flexible pipe technology and, and bring data from one end to the other end by inserting some optical fibers in the armors in the same way. And now we're working on technologies whereby we can measure uh, curvature variation at the top of the riser and therefore uh, estimate the number of cycles that the pipe has seen and therefore predict the residual service life. Now this is not quite mature yet, but we are actively working on that right now. And you can see, you can get a sense that with all this technology, your pipelines become active, they, they become condition monitored, and they can also provide you uh, with uh, a lot of information about the flow itself. So to some extent, it is a very important building block in the, uh, in the world of future subsea technology. And Tore, can you tell us a bit more about this automated system technology? So can we imagine a fully uh, electric uh, control or is it still a hydraulic? What 
Well, I think, first of all, um, the, the, today's production control system will gradually evolve uh, and include more data acquisition, the conventional controls we do today, and also process control. So you see, you, there will be a step change in the functionality of the control system. Electric versus hydraulic, um, I strongly believe that electrical system will, uh, will prevail over time. It will take time to do that. Electricity is a better energy carrier than, uh, than hydraulics. Um, response time is no issues. Very accurately controlled can you do with, with electrical system. FMC, we have developed a whole suite of actuator, electrical actuators that can go on, on subsea uh, uh, systems. Today we are using them on manifolds and chokes to, to gain, to gain uh, experience. The main issue with uh, switching all the way to all electric system is um, a safe way to store energy subsea in an emergency case where you have to shut in. Today, the way we store energy subsea is by compressing a big spring, and uh, that is the energy storage you have. And the day we, uh, we need it for closing of valves, you release and stroke, and then you have closed the valves. We have to get through the, um, um, the level where we can rely on batteries or all the storage uh, medium in order to fully switch to, uh, to all electric system, also for phase safe uh, closed systems. We are not there yet, we are working on it. I was encouraged to see some of the uh, advances that have been done on the energy storage side uh, earlier. Liquid metal batteries uh, sounded like an interesting, uh, instance, interesting device, but that is where we have to, uh, to fully uh, go through, verify that this is a safe way of storing energy for a, 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 an emergency shutdown need. Um, not, st still not there. In the meantime, we continue to add more and more all electric actuators on the seabed, driven by batteries and trickle charged by a small line, maybe in the armoring of the, uh, of the, uh, of the flexible line. Uh, so the, the ultimate goal in, in my head on, on all electric system battery driven is to avoid the use of a billiker. And Tora, what is your vision of the deep offshore in 2020, 2030? What will be the new frontiers in depth, for example? Well, uh, water depth is, is, is obviously one. You could say, if you go back in time and look at how we have conquered a water depth, I think that there was a historic uh, overview of water depth. We have basically been uh, doubling the water depth uh, every fifth year until now, and we are today at 3,000 meters. Um, and the reason we have been able to actually double the, the water depth uh, and, and how we operate in water depth is that we are based up to 3,000 meters. You can use the basic same principles as you do in shallow water. Internal pressure is larger than external pressure, and you energize seals and you close valves. And that's, that's the principle. Moving way beyond into the three and a half, four thousand meter range, you have to redesign those principles. Uh, you have to design for collapse pressure more than internal pressure, and, and that will take some time before. It's only a matter of time. We can solve it, we know how to solve it. Today, the, we believe that we should be able to conquer four and a half thousand meter where the Atlantic Rim is before we, uh, uh, before we uh, and that's a target we have, but it, it's, it's, it's quite a long time before we are, before we are there. And do you agree? Yes, in fact, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree, but I would like to add uh, another challenge, which is, I think, facing the, the, the deep water development, is the challenge of increasing oil recovery, as well as allowing, uh, I would say, difficult reservoir between brackets, you know, meaning uh, vis viscous oil uh, with uh, small reserves, uh, long away from, uh, long, uh, long distance from uh, uh, what we call a host, you know, the facility or the shore. And uh, I would say this is definitely the challenge that we have already today, you know, with uh, the tiebacks and so on on the platforms. But it's a challenge that we will have for long because the, the, when time passes, we will always want to be further and uh, developing more difficult uh, reservoirs. And I would just add, you know, as a personal uh, view that I, I believe my colleague share is that, you know, the subsea processing will definitely be the answer to this, uh, this way to recover more oil and, and uh, develop a difficult reservoir. And Claude, yeah, we're talking about frontiers. What can you say yeah. about Arctic? Uh, Arctic, uh, Arctic is, it's, another, it's another, I would say, problematics. I would say everything we develop for, uh, 
For deep water can be used in Arctic, but I would say there, there are some particular uh, environmental and I would say, uh, and uh, uh, climate is, is a bit tough, you know, and uh, long nights and so on. So <laughs> access to the above the field is not possible for, can be for long periods. And this definitely will bring problematics in terms of the IMR. But uh, it's sure that uh, things can be done, but I would say other, it's another step uh, than deep water. Uh, for sure, in some, some areas, in addition to the, the, the deep water technology, we will have to face the, the, the problem of the icebergs that can sometimes, uh, you know, in some places, uh, scour the, 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 the seabed, and that means that the, the, all the equipment subsea will have to be uh, below uh, the ground, you know, sometimes we speak about 10 meters, and this will be very, a big challenge to, to bury the pipeline uh, under that much. That definitely be a big challenge for the industry. And Valborg, Arca is working uh, in Arctic. Uh, yes, first of all, I'd just like to say that uh, when it comes to the Arctic, uh, I'm humble. It's, uh, it's really the real last uh, frontier. And uh, I think we must pay respect to that and make sure whatever we do, it's quality deliverables. Uh, I have a sketch here, an art impression uh, of a LNG facility in the Arctic. We talked a lot about subsea, we talked about subsea to shore, but that could also be a challenge in the Arctic. It's an extremely vulnerable ecosystem. We have permafrost and uh, this may be a solution because you have no infrastructure in the Arctic. And even though this is artist's impression in Arca, we have delivering some, delivered something similar. It is an artificial island of concrete, uh, where you, which you construct in a yard environment and all the facilities on top, and then you tow it to the location and put it on the seabed. This is for the Arctic, but we have done it outside uh, Venice for an LNG regasification terminal. It's not Arctic, but it's certainly uh, a vulnerable ecosystem. Yeah, and mm -hmm. Carl Lundin, exactly. Mm -hmm. From an environmental point of view, what is your position? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should be cautious, obviously. I mean, this is something that could break the industry and uh, at least some individual companies. Uh, it was interesting to hear uh, Christophe de Margeret on the 26th of September going out in Financial Times and basically warning against oil development right now because the risk for the industry is too high. Now, I'm sure there are a number of reasons for why he did that, but my overall take home message there is that one should be very cautious and you know, you need to have a plan B also if something goes wrong. Without a plan B, um, which we saw in Macondo, you do risk a lot. The second thing I think is we, we need also to look at the methane hydrates. Uh, my personal view is that this is gonna become a big issue. Um, clearly, we heard Mike Dawson this morning talk about the, the risk that there will be some uh, release of some of them, and I think the Arctic might be one of the main places. So perhaps that's a more interesting prospect to look at the, what one could do to halt um, methane hydrates. And finally, I would say there's a big issue also with seismic surveys. Uh, we've been working a lot with Shell in the Sakhalin Energy uh, Project, and clearly in terms of biodiversity impacts, that is one of the big ones. There must be a way of working with seismic surveys during winter time. So for all these good engineers we have in the room, maybe that's a next task to work on. Okay, and Tora, when do you think direct subsea to shore will become reality? Well, you, you could say that subsea to shore um, is a reality in some areas.